So um, you'll know from the blurb that this 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 session is 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 around intersectionality. But I thought I'd just get, give a little bit of what people will probably accuse me of rambling or going on about um, what what I think um, is going on in in Green ELT at the moment. And a lot of you people like Dan and Chris and Joe are, are veterans, if that's the right word, of, of the Green ELT thing. Dan was pretty much responsible for, I think, kicking off a lot of the awareness and uh, with, a, with, a, with, a, with a great job quite a few years ago down in Spain actually thinking about it and um where are we well it's interesting we, we I think if we sort of think about mitigating our impact you know the, the damage that we do there is greater awareness it's obviously a very um large elephant in the room when we're talking about language travel because language travel almost inevitably involves flying I mean there is in, uh, increased opportunities to, in Europe to jump onto trains but you know it is still expensive and awkward sometimes but there is discussion around that um and we've done work on with Green Action about the, the offsetting is it really a thing is it a myth is it a, what, all the discussion around that so there's awareness of that um and I think schools are thinking more and more about their energy suppliers you know trying to to, to buy electricity and uh, from um you know, sustainable suppliers yet i'm still somewhat shocked when i when i said i was chatting to someone from from a language school recently and i was like, what, what what initiatives you got in place she said we recycle and she looked at me as she thought she was due a nobel prize and well, actually I'm not really sure. I think we should be doing a little bit more than just recycling. Whether we should be recycling at all is another question. So it, it's, I think it's patchy in terms of the what we're doing in institutions. And I think it's, in, in a sense, there's more positivity, from my point of view, what's going on in the teaching side of stuff and what's going on in classes. I mean, course books are, you know, we're seeing the SDGs embedded into course books now. You know, I mean, maybe that's not ideal, but it's a lot better than it was five or six years ago. Publishers are beginning to think, OK, we do need to work on this. Lots and lots of teachers are you know, working away in, 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 in little groups of, of people within institutions, creating materials. We're seeing growing clubs and gardening clubs. We're seeing beach cleans and park cleans. I think there is there is a huge amount going on. But. We're not addressing the big issue within ELT we're not addressing the big issue which is the fact that all of this is basically caused by hydrocarbon companies you know a language school recycling or reducing its paper usage is something it's the big stuff isn't it and that's the worry you're looking course books you'll see course books talking about the climate crisis but not saying actually this is caused by and I think that's what something that we need to really engage with we're, uh, that's the next step for me is saying okay it's fine we're doing our bit we are we, we, we are reducing our energy usage we're we're getting seven-year-olds uh engaged with the sdgs that's all fantastic but ultimately there's a much bigger prize i think further down the line that's my first point my second point which kind of sachets into what we're going to talk about today is to think about climate change in its context Climate change is not just a thing on its own. It's all the impacts around it. And I think once we start bringing that into classrooms as well, we'll be kicking down even more doors. And that's where intersectionality comes along. And that's where we have got these two speakers today and debaters, Rose and Zarina. Um, some of you may know Rose and Zarina. I'll let them introduce themselves in, in a moment. Um, but any of you who were at the ISF or last ISF or conference in Brighton would have known that they are were both plenary speakers and um, they brought the house down. I think they really were immensely successful and they, they did say some things that needed saying on both sides. Um, so, Zarina, would you like to say a few words about yourself and then Rose about you and then we'll sort of start things off. Hi, yes, thanks, Chris. Um, my name <laughs> is Zarina Saban. I've been in ELT for over 30 years. Um, began life as a scientist, um, which took me into the EAP, ESP side of, of things in ELT. Um, I've been very interested in CLIL from the offset. Before it was even called CLIL, I was probably doing it, as were many teachers around the world um, in EAP, ESP. Um, I've taught at all levels in a variety of, of different contexts and countries. Um, in war-torn countries as well, developing world situations, global south, 
um, and learnt that um, the needs of, of students are very varied um, and yet the kind of materials that we seem to use are very focused on a particular part of the world and many other parts of the world don't relate. Um, so all of that has got me interested in, in sustainable education um, as well as um, continuing my interests in CLIL and of course diversity, equity and inclusion to try and get um, as many people involved in their learning process and not just seeing it as English as a, a subject. So that's me. Thanks. Thank you, Zarina. Rose, what about you? Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, so I work in mainly in teacher education. Um, that's sort of the, the main thing that I'm involved with. I also do a little bit of project work um, on the side and I've worked with several schools that are represented in the room, Nikki and Fiona, on the recent prelim projects. Um, but mostly my interest in kind of global issues, I suppose the reason why I'm here talking today is, um, yeah, this, this interest I've had since the very beginning of my teaching career and I've always tried to embed what I didn't really know at the time when I first started teaching as uh, critical pedagogy and um, what is often called global citizenship education. I think that's a kind of buzzword these days in ELT um, as part of that sustainable education, uh, social justice education, that all kind of comes into it. Um, and I'm very interested in bringing this into teacher education now because that's really mostly what I do. So looking at different ways of embedding that within um, our work in teacher education and particularly the overlap between language and language use and uh, and social justice or global citizenship education. As a veteran of ELT, I mean, taught my first class in 1981, God help us. I'm just thinking how different ELT is now from my barnstorming lessons on the third conditional to bunches of bored Swedish students to what we're doing now. It's just, um, it really has changed a lot over the years, for, very much for the better, I think. So picking that up, we, 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 we've, this, this, this term intersectionality is not, is not a new term outside of ELT, but it's kind of sliding into ELT in, in, in the last couple of years. Um, Rose, let's start with you. What is intersectionality in, in the LT context? What, what's, it, what's it all about? Um, well, I don't know. I think um, the concept I understand it is kind of everyone having complex, multiple identities which feed into our experience <laughs> of the world, basically. Zarina spoke beautifully about this at IATEFL. Um, and that includes kind of, it, it's often used, isn't it, to, to talk about privilege um, or lack of privilege and in terms of kind of discrimination. Um, and so you're not necessarily socially advantaged or disadvantaged because of a particular identity that you have or life circumstance, but you might be more statistically um, likely to be so. Um, so for example, I'm white, I'm a woman, I'm middle class, I speak English as my first language, university educated, um, I have experience in my family of mental health issues. No one of those particular aspects of my identi identity may make me, in all contexts, more privileged or less so. But that's it's a complex picture, and everyone everyone is is the, the same. Everyone has that unique mixture of different identities. Um, I think in terms of um, climate and the ecological crisis, I think we have to have an awareness that this has a a real impact on how how different people will experience the climate emergency differently, uh, particularly depending on your socioeconomic background, whether you are from, um, whether you're a displaced person, for example, whether you have a home. Um, if you're a person of colour or from the global south, you are disproportionately more likely to be affected by um, certain issues. Okay, thank you. Zarina, what's your, what's your take on this question? Yes, intersectionality, as you said, has been around a while. Um, originally, I think it reared its head in, in gender studies. Um, and um, it's, to me, it's the intersecting of, of powers um, that affect all of our social relationships that we have across societies. Um, as Rose already mentioned, gender, education, all of those things, colour of your skin, but things that we maybe 
are very subconscious about, such as height or age, um, the typical possessions and clothes that people wear can all actually affect our biases that we all have, uh, wherever we're from, whatever our, our situations are. Um, and so sometimes they're physically obvious and sometimes they're not. Um, neurodiversity in terms of how we think um, may not be very obvious until you're in a classroom with people and you may have students who um, have not been uh, given any label as to whatever their, their learning issues may be, but they're there. So some things may be very physically obvious and some things may be quite hidden. Um, and it's how people react to each other, um, certain assumptions that are made about you, uh, that you make about other people, um, and that puts you in a particular status as well. Um, and uh, the, there is revealed in society a kind of pecking order. Um, and I think that comes into ELT quite nicely because um, we're using English as a lingua franca to communicate across societies, across different areas, different um, roles. Um, and yet uh, the way you may use English, the, the accent that you may have, um, can define your your position in a meeting room, for example, or if we're in an online meeting like this, something like your internet access can can change your position and and how involved you are in in a discussion. Um, so all of of those kind of things. Um, I came across it very clearly in um, the global south where something like drought or lack of water meant that um, girls when they were menstruating didn't go to school because basically there were not washing facilities for them to be able to cope with what they had to deal with during those those days um, every month so they missed regular amounts of schooling throughout their, their um, teenage years basically until they left school um, so those kind of things come into play that uh, we may not always be aware of or conscious of. Um, so I think in ELT, we can bring those kind of issues out as a topic. If we just go back to the drought, because obviously the, there's a climate impact there. Is it, I do you can answer this or both. Um, it, is it fair to say that the impact of climate change is... Um, not the same everywhere absolutely yes yes um if if we were all on a level playing field and um then obviously you'd say yes drought affects us all in the same way but um if you're starting off in at different levels of, of having access to water whether it's clean or not um how much rainfall you get if it's a reliable source of of amount of water per month for, for all your needs if you have storage facilities or not uh, you know do you just simply turn on a tap and you get water or do you have to walk to the nearest spring or, or dig a hole to get it so um yes it, something like drought affects um billions of people in in a variety of ways across the globe and uh, many of us who have the privilege of uh, having ease of access to water, don't don't think about it at all. Um, well, there, there, I think you put your finger on it, didn't you? Have I? Yeah, we don't think they don't think about it. We don't think about it. You know. So the ELT classroom is a perfect, um, I think, area to get students thinking about it, um, because you 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 were saying earlier that. Is it enough just to get, you know, seven year olds thinking about recycling or whatever? But if we're getting students to think about these things, not just in their own setting, but in other settings, um, when they at a later stage are going to interact with people, they may have a little bit more empathy of, of their situation uh, and have a bit more understanding. And so when they hear their government say, well, actually, you in China and India, you need to slow down your your development because you're using too many resources and you're producing too much carbon. 
you know, they might just think again about whether that is fair or not. Mm -hmm. Rose, and we're kind of moving on to the second question. So, I mean, I think I know the answer is, do you think we should be addressing this in all our classrooms now? This, this not climate in isolation, but climate in context and the, the, the impacts in, in both directions? Yes. Is the short answer. Said, is that you I don't think there's anyone here in the room who disagrees. <laughs> well, I don't know. Well, well maybe, not in this, maybe not in this room, but um, potentially. why yes? Why yes? Um, hit, hit us well, just it. following on from what Serena was saying about <laughs> just discussing the, the topics in, in class, I think I think we have a really, really key role as language educators because one of the major battles <laughs> that we're fighting, if you think of yourself as an environmentalist, is messaging and communication and we are teaching communication and so the ability to communicate um, the issues that we face um, but also to be able to critique, critique that in the text that students read um, that's a really big part of what we, we should be bringing into the classroom so it's the skills um, as well as the, the actual content I think um, and I think, yeah, as, as teacher educators or as language teachers, that should be central at the forefront of, of what we do. Um, so for me, I think a really, I would, I would sort of think of it as threefold. We need to make space in our classrooms for critical pedagogy and, and global citizenship. Um, we're talking about critical issues. Um, I mentioned at ISF, I try not to talk about global issues or, or maybe controversial issues, although they may be controversial in different contexts. Some of these issues we're talking about are both global and local. So I prefer to talk about critical issues because I think they're personally really, really important, <coughs> but also involve a lot of critical thought and thinking and, you know, deep critical exploration. Um, so making space for them and talking about this in our in our lessons and in having space for this in the, embedded into the syllabus. Um, but also teachers need to know how to manage conversations and model and facilitate conversations on difficult topics, whether it's the climate or any other um, critical issue. Um, and that in includes modelling and developing the skills in our students to um, disagree um, politely, <laughs> to turn take well, to make sure that everybody in the room is getting space to have their voice heard and has there's a kind of you know equal participation in the conversation people are being heard um to make sure that um ideas are challenged um and that when discriminatory comments are made that they are challenged appropriately so that kind of those kind of skills is it, or what we should be doing in the class so that's the skill side of it the other side of it is the materials and making sure that there are materials available um and brought into the classroom, that those materials are both a window to the outside world, the world that is different to the ones that the students know and experience themselves, but also a mirror. I think this is um, this is an idea from Emily Stiles, where like mirrors and windows, I think it's a really nice metaphor for, for materials. So you're looking back at yourself and, um, and perhaps able, you know, critical critiquing your own culture as well through the materials that are in the classroom, but also getting access to um, very different cultures, cultural experiences, diverse understandings and perspectives of the world. Um, so I think those, for me, those are the kind of three areas that we, we should be working on within ELT in, in, in critical issues and kind of the climate crisis is just one part of that. I would include all issues um, that could be potentially controversial or considered global. What I really like about what you said there, Rose, is you 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 kept it embedded in ELT because you talked about turn taking, about asking difficult questions, about disagreeing, and it, and because I think there are barriers put up, which is another one of our questions later on, put up by teachers saying, "I'm an English teacher, I, I I can't do any of this stuff. This is not my thing. I don't know anything about it." Well, in fact, the first half of what you said there was very much around ELT, wasn't it? It's the stuff that we teach, like you say, turn taking difficult questions. It's yeah. ELT, but very, very with a very different focus on it. I mean, we we, we touched there upon some of these issues are sensitive, culturally, and challenging. Um, Zarina, I know, I mean, you worked in countries where that might or might not be the case. H how can we manage that? Because there are countries around the world where gender, for example, is a very hot potato. Mm. What do we do? Yeah. What, what do we tell teachers to do? How can we support them? I, well, firstly, <laughs> I don't think we do should be telling teachers what to do. 
Um, mm. And I think uh, it should be a case of here are things that are covered by global issues or, or climate action or climate change issues, um, diversity, equity, inclusion issues. Um, and what is suitable in your context? I mean, it's basically the same as what I think ELT is supposed to have been doing all of these years anyway, is, is saying, here's English, here's the language, you do with it what you will. Um, and I think what we're talking about here in terms of, of gender for, as one example um, of, of the intersectionality issues, it's just a content carrier, if you like. Um, and um, English uses various content carriers. You know, traditionally ELT textbooks may have focused on, on something like fashion or shopping or going on holidays. Yeah? But they're all, if you think about it, very um, product consumerism type of things, which don't suit half the, the world. Um, so. Uh, that's where I think materials need to change. Um, but in, in areas of the world where maybe gender is a sensitive topic, um, it, I think it, it needs to be contextualised. So, you know, just things like look out the window, how many, how many people do you see? How many of them are male? How many of them are female? How can you tell? Uh, what are your assumptions about what they do? And then ask the question, why? And often um, the way we ask questions in an ELT classroom, you know, we're eliciting language. So we're doing the same things that you would do in any ordinary ELT classroom, um, but you're, you're going deeper into those issues so that um, students and teachers together are exploring uh, the systems that are in place around them and becoming a bit more critical. So you're increasing critical thinking, critical awareness, um, learning to reflect on your own cultures, your own um, areas of what is normal and what isn't. Um, and you're doing what, what Rose so eloquently talked about in her ELT presentation as disrupting the norm. And you're helping students to just question why is it like that should it be like that um, and so you've got a whole range of, of language opportunities there as this is what we do now this is what we have always done um, is this what we will continue to do you've got a whole range of, of tenses going on there so it's all very language rich um, you don't have to move a million miles away from the grammar and vocabulary um, but these things are just carrying the content and language for you. It's a form of content language integrated learning. Well, if you like. Whereas I think the, sorry, the content may be slightly controversial, um, but I think that ability for teachers to be able to hand it over to the students and to be very conscious of not telling them what to think, but just getting them to think. Is, is a start. Um, and yes, a lot needs to be done on, on teacher education because it can be seen as something that's attacking a system that is in place and is well accepted. Um, and I found that in, in a, a few parts of the world where you know many of the teachers are male um, and talking about gender issues is an issue is is you know is seen as an attack on on the male teacher perhaps um and so i think you need to tread gently but hand over the choice um and give a variety of choices so that they can choose the content carrier i think again what you said serena will be very reassuring for teachers to hear because you're still embedding what you say in the familiarity of structure of language of the, of their day job basically what they've been doing for some years rather than because i think one of the problems with climate change education is there's a risk that people like me go in and say oh we got it oh no 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 i can't do that this is all different uh, my job's to teach english not this stuff but you you both took the very sensible position of building on um 
you know what they're familiar with and i think that, that that's really valuable isn't it um are there any other barriers do you think rose that we have to that we have to deal with i mean one may be around the sensitivity of the topics in certain cultures and um and climate change is a sensitive topic in some countries obviously the the, the petro states and these kinds of places it's 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 awkward any other barriers you think we need to deal with rose yeah when i was thinking about this um in preparation for today i remembered i'd given an iotafel presentation different one on uh on basically on this the kind of fears that teachers have about dealing with critical issues in general um and i came up with i'm just going to list them here and give you a little bit of brief backgrounds i think it's five one two three four five six fears um that teachers generally have and i think it doesn't cover everything um but it's a good good kind of framework um so the first is fear of ignorance and that's i think that's very typical with uh, climate education is that teachers are worried that they don't know enough about the topic. So that would be one reason why uh, teachers don't feel willing to address um, these kinds of issues. Um, fear perhaps that the learners also know more than them in some contexts. Um, the second is fear of causing offence if the issue is particularly sensitive, like we've talked about already. Um, so that, you know, if you're dealing with controversial topics that someone in the class might get upset, that you'll lose trust with the learners, which obviously is so important. Um, the next is fear of deviation. So this is, um, and I think a lot of teachers I've heard express this, this is the idea that you're deviating from the syllabus and the syllabus is language and you should be just teaching grammar and vocabulary. And if you are bringing in other topics, um, then you shouldn't be doing this or that there isn't time to do this, that this is like an add on that is going to take more time that we don't have time for this. Um, and I hear that a lot from a lot of the teachers I work with. Um, fear of losing control is a big one, especially if a topic is slightly controversial. Um, that's a concern about classroom management and that um, that discussing certain issues will open a can of worms and that they will somehow lose control of the class and that in many contexts that's that's a really um something that is not is not okay to not have complete control of the class at every mm -hmm. uh, at all times um fear of failure the idea that if you are dealing with these kind of issues you're sort of you're setting yourself up to fail because you're not going to be able to change your students minds or behaviors or attitudes um, I mean, there's a lot I could say about this, but I'm just going to put the, the ideas out there. There's a big question there over whether we should be trying to change minds. Um, fear of condemnation. Um, and that's obviously a very real concern that certain stakeholders, whether it's the institution that the teachers work for, the parents or the students themselves um, may disapprove of certain topics being talked about in the classroom. And that's um, that's important because teachers also, in, in, in a lot of contexts, they do need to think carefully about what they talk about in class because of their own personal safety and security. Um, that, that is a big and very real issue. So, yeah, I think there are a lot of reasons why teachers do avoid um, critical issues. Um, but that's quite a, like that's problematizing it. I don't, you know, for me, obviously, I, I think that we should be addressing these in the classroom. It's about how. Um, but I think it's important to think about why why teachers don't. Yeah, and I, I think you're right. I mean, there are some things that can be addressed possibly by CPD, but a lot of them are, struct uh, are structural or cultural issues in the Ministry of Education. In, uh, I mean, project I've been working on recently, the government has made massive statements about environmental education. We're going to be doing this, we're going to be doing this. You know, all on a nice piece of paper is, is fine. But you go into schools and no one's told the inspectors. So you know you can't you can't waste time doing that. We've got you've got to cut exams next Monday. And there's mm -hmm. a complete mismatch. And the teachers quite understand and say, Well, I'm sorry, but we we got we've been told we've got to do the exam next Monday, so we've got to do 10 more past papers this week or something equally dull. And so it it the it it's absolutely it's getting stakeholder engagement and the teachers are, are, are obviously one of the stakeholders but they're by no means the only one and sadly they're probably one of the least influential ones as well in many cases i think it's it's people in the ministries it's, as I say, it's the inspectors and how how we battle fight those battles and, and they are battles as well i think it's really interesting um Could student motivation yeah, yeah. Zarina, something. yeah. 
Um, what what you're talking about there is intersectionality within the education <laughs> system, right? The yeah. power um, of of those social re relations mm -hmm. between those people. And so yeah, it has to be the change has to be at every single level for it to to succeed. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. And I would and, just mm. just like to say, if I, if mm. I may, that um, I think that the need is to to not do something as an add on to not make it something different to what you're doing anyway. So yes, there's an exam coming up and they really haven't grasped the third conditional or, or the passive voice. Um, is there a way in which I can use a topic such as, as maybe climate change um, and practice the third conditional mm -hmm. or practice the, the you know, passive voice at the same time? Um, so that, I think, is, is something that uh, we need to help teachers with as teacher educators. Yeah, to keep it embedded, basically, as you say, yeah. that it's not it's not a luxury if you've got time. It's kind of at the end of the news. It was a quiet news day. And then finally, here's a cat playing the piano. It's that it's seen as that if we've got a bit of time, we'll do that is absolutely yeah. means it won't get done, I think. Yeah. And so it, it's, it has to be a, not a, a daily theme, but I mean, a regular occurrence built in. And that's course books syllabus and it's the stakeholders many of whom in my experience feel threatened and become very defensive and you, yes. you're kind of dealing with that and the teacher is just stuck there basically not really knowing uh, uh, how they can how they can manage it student motivation Zarina do, do you think I mean there's always there's, there's this idea that, that that teenagers particularly are very engaged with climate they're very engaged with I know you don't like the term global issues that they, they're very concerned that got legs, um, do you think, or is that not quite? Is it is it is it a massive cultural variation? I don't know. I'm interested in what you think. I I personally think it it depends where in the world you are. Yes. Mm. Um. So those who have the privilege to to be able to think about these things, and there are fewer other pressing things to be thinking about, then yes, there is a kind of movement and a shift in mindset. Um. And I think some of, of the, the people in social media are setting the, the theme as well. Um, so other people are beginning to follow. But in other parts of the world, um, no, if, if you're a, a girl in a rural area in the global south, you have to get up at the crack of dawn, cut some grass, feed the cow so you can have some milk uh, and be able to get your morning cup of tea before your day starts. You've already been working maybe three or four hours before you go to school. Um, so maybe um, you don't even use plastic products or, or tinned things. So recycling is is maybe a meaningless thing. Um, so, yes, the, depending where you are in the world, um, I think it, young people, teenagers are driving um, the fact that that. Uh, issues such as global issues or critical issues um, want to be discussed in the classroom. But I think at the same time, there are other things that, that if we hand over the power, um, something that, that um, Rose mentioned was that fear of losing control. Um, I think part of it is that teachers need to hand over that, that power to students more to be able to choose their own themes or, or content carriers in a way. Um, you know, it's it's like project-based learning was something at the end of the unit. So if you had time for it, you would do it. Otherwise it would get missed out and it was okay. Mm. Um, you didn't miss anything essential grammar or ver vocabulary wise in terms of the unit. So instead of doing things like handing over to the students, at the end of a unit, but maybe actually to say, okay, this topic is maybe a little bit obscure for us, um, but is there a topic that you would like to talk about and trying to bring meaningful things into the classroom that they are into, um, whether it's, you know, how far they have to walk to school or, or whether there's a, a canteen where they can get food in school or not, or um, talking about you know how much time they spend in nature, um, whatever it is, however 
loosely it can be connected to the environment the world around them what it is that that preoccupies their mind should be used i think um, and mm. i think that's one way to ensure motivation in the classroom and we're always worried in in an english language um, learning or teaching setting of uh, not having meaningful context of things being too artificial and, and having these activities and grammar exercises that are just sort of practicing a, a particular set of language or structure. Um, and instead of making it superficial, making it more real is is one way of doing it is to hand over to the students mm. so they take the reins. And I think Zarina, a, a lot of teachers in a lot of contexts will need support to do that because it, it's anathema to them, the fact that, that, that I think, oh, I've lost control. You know, it, it's yeah. the thing about teacher talking time. It's the same thing. If I'm not talking, then I'm not, you know, I've lost them. And yes. uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with you. It's just how we get teachers over that yeah. threshold of feeling happy to take that step back. Rose, any thoughts? Of, yeah, Sorry. go on. What one way of doing that is maybe working with other teachers in other subjects. So mm. you've got this this um, you know multi curricular um, activities that may be going on. So you've got information being fed from different sources mm. that could be given an added context and motivation. So it becomes more relevant to all of the subjects that the, the students are studying, and it's not just about English either. So they can. Really I agree. Yeah. Yeah, if you're in a secondary school, you get the geography teacher to come in, you know, and it, not necessarily in English, maybe possibly in the home language, 10 things you need to know about climate change. Um, just that. Well, it could, be, it could yeah. be in their own subject lessons. They yeah. don't even have to come into the English lesson. No, absolutely. But I think showing the connectivity integration, I absolutely agree, is really important. Rose, motivation. Specifically on climate issues or just generally on generally climate um, and yeah. beyond um i mean i think i agree with everything that zarina's just said <laughs> um if we look at and uh, maybe she's the example of um someone in the global south who may not have a smartphone and not have access to um all the information that a lot of our more privileged learners are um i'd like yeah if if we think about a lot of teenagers these days do have access to a huge amounts of information via social media. That's how they access their news. That's how they access all sorts of things. Um, I think there's a place for bringing that more into the classroom, but critiquing it, obviously. So teachers need to be um, able to engage in critical discourse analysis and show their students how to do that. So it could be democratizing it a little bit and inviting the students to bring in um, TikTok videos or whatever it is that they're watching these days, all the cool kids. Um, um, or it could be um, using more commercials, advertising, because I think this is one of the problems with social media and the easy access to information that young people have with smartphones is that they are so, um, they're, they're being flooded with advertising. Um, by the minute, by the second, you know, we're, we're seeing we're seeing thousands of ads and they are seeing so many more because they are on social media. And sometimes they don't even know that they are because their favorite influencer is sponsored by someone to create content on their behalf and so on. So I think it's kind of bringing that critical engagement into the classroom, allowing the students to bring the materials, but then engaging in critical um, discourse analysis, I suppose, is what it is really mm -hmm. um, critical literacy. Um, and you have to have that as a teacher yourself to be able to encourage students to do it. And I know that's it's a big ask because a lot of teachers, um, it, it's a skill we need to develop. Um, so, yeah, that's something I would like to see more in teacher education. And also arguably in course books. That too. In, in content. I mean, Aaron Stibby, he says, you know, that, that a lot of course books are really actually... Um, consolidating the system they're actually that they're not challenging it at all they're if, if, so many course books you look at are full of consumerism people yeah you know, that's what they're about and, or in a positive way and um that's that's not changing yeah and kind of like subliminal advertising and ah, absolutely you know there's there's products mentioned all the time in course books i think totally yeah, yeah. or identifiable products anyway yeah, yeah certainly and i think think the other thing is is um you know, particularly for students like in the global, 
So I think okay. you're you're freezing and unfreezing, Zarina, unless you fell asleep. But I don't think you did. There was a glorious moment when your screen stopped, when Rose was in full full flow, and I thought she's dropped off. But I don't think you had. Go on, Zarina. I'm back. I'm you're awake. Back. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to, to pick up on the, the point of consumerism in in, mm. in textbooks. Um, you've got the same textbooks going to the global south, and that, that image. You f you're breaking up, Zarina. What is accepted? Got the last bit. I think we got the point. What is accepted? So you're saying that course the same course that's being used in but in, in 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 all in the same context basically. No, I think you're but, right. Definitely right. So it's it's something to aspire to if you're in the global south and you don't have those things, mm. um, and that doesn't help the, the climate in any way. Not at all. Not form. at all. You're right, and and I think it, it's still a problem. And I think a, a problem for 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 people working in the global north is that a lot of st students think it nothing. To, it's nothing to do with me, really. It doesn't have any impact on me. And because I live in Stockholm, I live. I mean, there are impacts, but they're not as obvious it, 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 than someone who lives for for student lives in Sub-Saharan Africa, perhaps. So I think that's another challenge. Getting the it's motivated. getting closer year on year, though, isn't it? I mean, I it think, is getting. Yeah, you know, it's getting worse. It was five years, and I don't. You yeah. Know, uh, yeah. There's, there's uh, students talking about the wildfires in their countries in in mm. Europe. There's students talking about the recent floods. Flooding. Yeah. 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 So, I was going to say it's getting better, but that's the wrong way to push it, actually. But you know what I mean. Awareness it, it, is it, growing. It, yeah, it is. Yeah. But I mean, Daniel Goldman wrote this thing about and he talked about seeing what you can't see, didn't he? And I think that's, that's quite an interesting idea, getting students to, to, to understand what's going on out there, the impacts. Though you're right, it's, it's climate change is coming to get us in the global north. Final question before a bit of a discussion. Um, teachers or stakeholders say we can't do this. It's political. What do we do? Rose. Um, I think the everyday is political. Mm -hmm. um, I think, uh, I don't know, we need to sort of, uh, I, yes, the P word, it's sort of like a, it, everyone gets worried about it, don't they? Um, they still do, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think we need to take a step back and think about what, I mean, what our education system set up to do? Uh, why do we teach? Um, in the past, if you were very lucky and very privileged, you could just do your subject because you you loved it and you just wanted to learn about classics or learn a foreign language or, you know, that these days we are told a lot of the time students are told that they are, you know, their our education for them is is so that to help them get a job, to help them succeed in the workplace, which is it's a bit sad. I mean, it's great that we're teaching transferable skills that may enable uh, students, particularly if you come from a less privileged background, to succeed in the world and to kind of improve their socioeconomic status. But it does reduce students simply to kind of a cog in this capitalist mm. wheel. <laughs> um, but really, I, th I, mean, I believe anyway that education should be something that provide you with a kind of passport to become a more active citizen, mm -hmm. whether that's if you're lucky enough to have a, a country that you are a citizen of or a citizen of the world. And I think what we should be doing is thinking about education in those broader terms. Um, so if that is the case, then education is political um, because that's the, the kind of purpose of it is to, in, you know, encourage and provide students with the the possibility of engaging in civic life um, that's why we teach maths geography science the arts but also language and yeah so i think the everyday is political i think i mean we talk about office politics family politics uh, that's usually more negative but actually it's all about how we organize our societies and our communities how we participate in them or not um, and they may involve like very legitimate disagreements about certain things i think yeah, I think it's important to to see education like that as as providing opportunities to be part of a, a wider community. I agree, it, but it is a common accusation or common concern. I mean, the the p word is a dirty word, isn't it? Serena, what do you think about politics then? Well, I all, think that, all that response authentic. to politics. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I completely agree with everything that that was just said now by Rose. Um, but also, I think since the pandemic we've seen how 
there's been ease of access and communication and people are working online you don't have to leave your country anymore to be interacting with with other people in english english has really taken that first place as a lingua franca um and so i think we're doing a disservice to our students if we're not preparing them to be interacting with people from different cultural backgrounds, different cultural understandings, um, different perspectives. Um, so we need to prepare our students to interact with other people who may have a, a different political opinion, may have a different religious opinion, may have um, a completely different set of ethics. Or, uh, uh, and we need to help our students to be tolerant to the rest of the world. Um, if they're going to succeed in the 21st century, they need to be able to adapt and be flexible with who they interact with. Um, so if we say, oh, you know what, gender in our culture and country is like this, and that's it, we can't talk about it in any other way, well, your students are going to be interacting with people with a different set of opinions on that. Uh, and if they're going to be successful, um, in whatever it is they do uh, with English, they need to be able to explain themselves, explain their own opinions, um, to uh, politely disagree or politely interact on certain discussions. And if we never prepare them for thinking about those things critically or logically, uh, we're doing them a disservice and they're not going to succeed in the world. And if anything, Education is about giving students skills and opportunities to further themselves and reach their full potential. And if we we're not, if we're ignoring these issues, then we're not going to be doing that. I'll vote for that. Definitely vote for that. Um, but again, it's 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 other stakeholders who, you know, intervene. And it's 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 a similar discussion we had before, isn't it? But I absolutely agree. But uh, yeah, so uh, parsnips are parsnips dead. The parsnips gone? <laughs> no, I think they're still very much there. I was just thinking um, about parsnips because, you know, obviously one of the peas in parsnips is pork. And how can you, I always use this as an argument, like how can you say I don't, I don't eat pork if you want to convey your religious beliefs, if that is one of them. And, you know, if you're never able to talk about pork and you don't know the word for pork in English, how can you convey that when you go to a different culture or whatever so it's it's really just to reiterate everything Zarina's just said it's so important that students have the ability that the language for this and that might be the vocabulary and the grammar but I think it's also wider critical skills ability to critique mm. discourse and engage in critical discourse yeah I think part snips OIP but probably not for a while they seem to be living on unfortunately don't they in the minds of certain individuals well that was interesting thank you very much Zarina and Rose for giving us your time um it's it's a really nice to get that kind of not a helicopter view but 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 a different view of of um environment in classes in elt um if anyone has any questions um probably because there's not many of us here rather than using the chat box switch on your mic and ask away to either of our speakers probably not to me um if anybody questions or comments or feedback just just switch on the mic and we're all ears. A lot of food for thought, says Fiona. Indeed, yes, parsnips for thought, even. You see what I did there. Any uh, other questions? Was, Hi, John, uh, yeah. That was very interesting. Yeah, thank, thanks Thanks very much for that. I, I suppose um, I, I was just going to ask whether, I mean, it's a long time since I've been um, involved in actually um, teaching. Um, so... I, I'm not completely up to speed with with some of these things, but I was going to ask. I suppose my my impression is that very often in our world we we are dealing, in a sense, with the the one percent. You know, you, you you mentioned Rose that we, you know most of us on this call will be from a pretty middle class educated background and so on. Do you, have you, and and back to that politics question. Have you found that that's an issue in the in the classroom that you know i suppose if if you if you come from a very wealthy background for example where I, and again i'm i'm generalizing like mad but um i assume that quite a lot of 
the students who who are able to come on these courses do come from a relatively wealthy background so perhaps used to getting on planes and not thinking about thing that, that that's the climate and so on do you have you found that or am i just um projecting <laughs> onto students rose Serena, either of you i think it i mean it how long is a piece of string? It's really different. It depends on the depends on the group, depends on the students, mm. right? There are some students who are very privileged and who are not aware at all of their privilege. Mm. I was recently teaching a group from Argentina who came across to the UK and they were really critically engaged. And everything I talked about with them in the classroom, it was like they knew about it. They, you know, they were very aware, they were very, you know, very relatively progressive. I don't know. Um I don't know. I'm not particularly familiar with the Argentinian education system, but they were they were really engaged. So I think it's it's difficult to generalize. Yeah. Mm. Um, I've dealt with with teachers who come in for courses and uh, it's the first time they've stepped on a plane. Um, that the whole thing is a completely new experience for them. Mm. Um, so, yes, they're very privileged, but they've sent, been sent across by the, the Ministry of Education, for example, for, for a, a month course on teacher education. Um, so, yeah, very, very varied. Um, and then you get you know, a set of European teachers coming in for the same kind of course, completely different outlook, um, completely different experience. Um, and, yes, it's, it's just another course for them. It's mm. um, so yes, privilege means that in a way you you might take less uh, opportunity that you're given because it's almost a given. It, it's not seen as that. And, and those who are underprivileged uh, soak up every single second of the experience of mm. of a of a teacher education course um, and get as much out of it as they probably can um, with the few um, economic possibilities that they have you know and they're not studying maybe they don't have that that ability to travel within the country that they would love to because they can't afford it you know so they're counting the pennies uh, to be able to afford a trip to London at the weekend or something like that so uh, yes very right across the board completely different experiences thanks Interesting. Anybody else like to ask anything? Because we're nearly up to the hour. And I know a lot of people have to go off to do whatever they do at five o'clock. Nikki is going. Is that a question, Nikki? Or you see, she's waving. Nikki's waving. Bye. Thanks for coming by, Nikki. Bye, Nikki. Any other, anything from anybody else? So I'm using my, yeah, yeah. Chris. So um, thank you, um, Rose and Serena. Um, Really, really interesting. And and what's been going through my mind is uh, that the word that have, has come up several times, you know, the challenge of um, for the teacher of knowing enough to be able to talk about these things. Uh, but I guess you answered that in a way by 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 saying that it, perhaps the teacher doesn't have to know everything. All the teacher has to do is to be able to ask the question: What do we think about? Climate change. What I was just, as you said that, vulnerables? I was just thinking that the challenge is actually for the teacher to be have the skill to be able to and and the um, making themselves vulnerable enough to be able to say actually I don't know, and and I mean that plays into that wider question of in a, in certain education systems I would argue in many education systems mm. teachers are not encouraged to do that. Mm. And that is considered loss of control because you lose the respect, if you like, of your students. It might be said that, you know, because you don't have all the answers to all the questions, um, you don't know enough. But actually, that is very much what we should be working towards, I think, is more, you know, better questions yeah. to get better answers. Yeah. Yeah. I may just ask Interesting. one I'm Joanne with the CAE, Cambridge Academy of English. And I think um, that that... Um, going into it as a discussion and a partnership there um, is really key right at the the onset. And I think um, all of those, as you said, those skills that you have to explicitly teach, um, the discussion skills, you know, having those language prompts on little cards so they know how to ask a question, how to build on someone's idea, how to disagree um, politely and 
right at the beginning there being very um, kind of clear that um, it, it's all of you in the discussion and that it's a, a collaboration um, and being very upfront at the beginning. N no single one of us in the room um, has all the answers, but when we discuss them and explore them in a kind of safe and challenging way as well, um, that we can come up with some of these ideas and solutions together. Um, and I think that's kind of really empowering, um, recognising that students bring so much into the classroom already, whether that's just from their own life experience or, you know, the video they literally watch kind of walking in on their phone um, and reminding them of that because sometimes they feel kind of completely overwhelmed just by the amount of, um, as you say, information out there, um, not knowing how much of it is true or not or how to kind of navigate it. So I think that all of those discussion skills and collaboration skills are key um, and kind of focusing on that partnership and collaboration with them. Um, and I've no idea what parsnips are, apart from the ones uh, that we, was this like an acronym for? Um, it was. Okay. Can you remember what they were, anyone? I, the first one was yeah, pork, so I can't remember. I, I gathered it was an acronym, but... Uh, yes, yeah, an acronym. Rose is not the fact. Do you know? Them? Do you remember? I can't yeah. remember them. So it's an acronym that I think came from ELT Publishing orig originally, yeah, and it was basically topics that were not in, usually typically included in globally published course yeah. materials. Yeah. Mm. So it's politics, alcohol, right. religion, um, sex, sexuality, mm -hmm. nudity or narcotics, mm -hmm. I for isms, which is like uh, kind yeah. of ideologies. The entire world. Yeah. Um, and P for pork. Okay. Now we know, you see. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Excellent. Well, that's great. So we're, let's, let's say we're on the hour now. Um, Anka has put in the chat a few uh, climate resources links, most of which will be familiar to you. Um, I did them uh, somewhat short notice without putting too much thought in them, unfortunately, but there, there may be some useful things there for you to have a look at. Um, again, great thanks to Rose and Serena, as ever thought provoking, as indeed they were down in sunny, not so sunny Brighton uh, mm -hmm. earlier this year. And as I say, for, for a, an, an old ELT person like me, it is astonishing how language has changed language education has changed and it's continuing to change but even more astonishing how much more it needs to change i think as well there's a lot of a lot of things that we collectively can do um but the one percent thing is, is a thing you know that you you are self-selecting that's what you're here 